Also, so what happened was, is it was okay. Should I start? Here we go. So I guess um, good to see everyone again, and I'm really pleased to be able to have Anders Sandberg uh, talking to us today. I guess Anders was uh, involved right at the very start of uh, FHI. So, um, yeah. It's always a pleasure to listen to. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you shouldn't say that before we talk. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, we can take it as a kind of a Bayesian prior. Let's start with this and see what the talk posterior will be. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to talk uh, today about observer effects. So, uh, the classic one that everybody tends to bring up is uh, sampling bias. The problem when you're trying to figure out something about the real world and you take a few samples from that and then you hope they're representative enough that you can draw a good conclusion. So the and an archetypical example is the Literary Digest 1936 that was trying to predict who's going to win the American election. And they did uh, a very large survey and they probably conclusively concluded that the Rep Republican Langdon would win probably well. And then of course uh, uh, there was that uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt guy who strangely won with a huge margin. And the Literary Digest, really, their reputation took a serious hit you know, this way. Because it turned out that they had very carefully you know, done phone interviews and checked weekly registered records and contacted people. But these are generally well off people if you think about the Depression era America. So, of course, they had a bias towards being Republicans. So it was a very non random sample. Uh, so, this uh, was the start for people to actually get very serious about it. Let's randomize something when doing polling. And gradually, of course, we developed the whole uh, science of uh, the study design in order to try to get as good uh, samples as possible. Ideally, they should be random. Of course, in practice, we quite often use convenience software. If I want to figure out something, I might ask my friends. But that's, of course, problematic because my friends might actually be a very special part of the population. If I were to ask my friends what language they speak, I will generally find that uh, a surprising number of them compared to the world population speak English and Swedish. And very few of them are actually speaking Chinese. Uh, so you can, of course, get this kind of selection of sampling biases in different ways. In many cases, it's just because your randomization is not good or your method of getting the samples has a problem. So if you're using a net to catch fish, fish is smaller than the net size will uh, escape through it. If you try to use some bait for some uh, animal, maybe males or females of this animal uh, like the bait at a different rate, which means that might get a gender disparity in your sample. And then, of course, uh, there are the more dodgy things uh, where people actually do cherry-pick data uh, or uh, make samples that kind of guarantee that you get the right result. And this range from uh, outright fraud to continuing your study until you get a positive result and then loudly declaring that, look, we, we clearly are getting such a positive result that we actually have a moral obligation to stop now. <laughs> And it might perhaps even be a moral obligation to stop uh, if you really believe in it, but it might still mean that it, it actually is no good and has some serious uh, issues. Uh, also, of course, we have this interesting thing about there can be very subtle correlations in the pattern. For example, do you know that on average your friends have more friends than you? The friendship paradox is wonderful and frightening <laughs> and mildly depressing, of course. And the reason is, in a social network, some nodes, some people have a lot of friends. And uh, compared to the average nodes, they, of course, have more. So if you look uh, around among your friends, you're relatively likely to be connected to one of those uh, hyper-network people. Uh, so it turns out that, uh, yeah, on average, your friends have more friends than you. You might argue, some of us are hyper-networked. We actually have friends who have fewer connections than we are. But that, there are relatively few people who can claim to do that. They're a minority. On average, you're having this problem. And this, of course, leads to all sorts of interesting things, because this also applies, of course, to companies having business dealings with each other. And, uh, and uh, Twitter followers, uh, in, uh, they get interesting things when you start thinking about infections, since they tend to follow uh, the social network. So you might actually want to vaccinate not random people, but friends of random people. 
You select <laughs> people at random and then ask them, name a friend, and then you give him the <laughs> <laughs> and this is more effective because in many cases you want the highly networked people to be vaccinated before the normal people. Might be more polite, of course, to give the person who mentioned the realm first, but still. Uh, and uh, this also works for academic uh, citations. If you think of this as a network of co-authorship, uh, it turns out that your co your co-authors generally are more uh, have more connections than you have. Again, slightly annoying and disturbing. So the problem here is of course that uh, we have a selection of uh, the data we get. It can be even more subtle than that. We tend to do science and studies in areas where we think it's worthwhile to work. And part of that is that there is something important going on, but it might also be, of course, that we actually have good tools there. We know how to do studies in those areas, so a lot of studies get done and we refine the tools, and that makes us believe that the world looks in a particular way because we have an awful lot of science showing how stuff is going on. While we're generally overlooking the areas where we don't have as good tools. Uh, my favorite example is uh, fractal geometry. Um, for a very long time we had good geometrical tools that were for simple shapes like spheres, cones, uh, and uh, cubes. And uh, we had a well-developed mathematical machinery that could be applied that, uh, you know, to model nature. And then there was, of course, those clouds and mountains and other stuff that didn't exactly fit in. And it was only the late uh, quarter of the 20th century where people seriously started with fractal geometry. Before that, fractals were generally regarded as weird pathological counterexamples to the normal intuitions that everything is differentiable in geometry and so on. Again, we didn't have really the good tools to study the weirdly shaped fractal things, so that hence they were generally ignored, even though nature is full, completely crammed with them. In fact, in general, a, a natural object tends to be fractal. So this way we can get a biased view of what's going on in the world, even on a higher meta level. Of course, sometimes these biases can produce interesting problems. So this is a classic example. Uh, of uh, uh, bias. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about this. It's fairly famous. Uh, so during the Second World uh, War, and, and, uh, the you know, US military were rather convert, convert. They had the problem during the flights over Europe that uh, a lot of planes were shot down, and uh, the planes that came home, home had uh, quite a lot of bullet holes in them. They wanted to add armor, and the problem is, of course, you can't put armor everywhere on the plane because then it's a tank and then it's not going to fly. So, where to put the armor? And um, they tried a few things, and they actually made things worse. worse. So then they asked the statistician, Abraham Wald, uh, where to put it. So Wald was in, uh, inspecting the planes in the hang, standing in the hangar, like counting bullet holes, and then gave a very simple recommendation. Uh, do you any of you know the punchline, what it was? Yeah? Put the armor where the bullet hole bounced. Exactly. Because you have a selection effect here. The, these are the planes that came home. The planes that had bullet holes here and here never came home. So you get a very strong selection effect. But if you try to put a lot of armor in the places where there are lots of bullet holes, you're actually armoring the stuff that doesn't matter. Uh, so this kind of survivorship bias is another form of selection effect that can really mess up studies. And it's also one reason, of course, why almost all hedge funds have done better than the market. Because the hedge funds that didn't have quietly disappeared. So all the remaining hedge funds will uh, happily show you totally truthful statistics about how they have done very well. Yep. So uh, this uh, leads to other fun things. So, so one uh, the bizarre uh, observation is that when you're standing in a queue, uh, it's actually very common for barbecue to actually be faster than your queue. It's not just a feeling. Uh, there is a psychological aspect to this, uh, of course. Uh, there might be more salience to being stuck in a really slow queue. You get uh, annoyed and that memory really may get burned into your memory. And of course, if it's a very short and inconsequential queue, you don't remember it. But leaving that aside, it's actually relatively obvious that uh, we must be spending more time in the slower queue because we spend more queue moments in that queue. So if we imagine that we have two queues and one is twice as fast as the other, uh, we should expect that uh, if I'm in the fast queue, I'm spending a certain amount of time T in that. But divided over overall t time, I would be spending this T divided by T plus 2 T, one third of the total time. While I would be spending two thirds of the total time in 
I'm randomly selected between these queues. Let's assume it's uh, uh, my local drugstore or something where I'm going every day. So on average, I would be more in the slow queue. I would actually be right in thinking it's annoying. Now, in the case of a queue in a grocery store, of course, switching queue is not a good strategy. On the road, it might actually be a good strategy. Nick uh, has a page in the old paper where he looks <coughs> briefly at this and points out that give, ignoring things like risk and yeah, the inconvenience, if you actually switch, uh, you, and, and everybody's doing the switching, you attempt to average the speed uh, of uh, the two uh, uh, traffic queues. So everybody actually gets past the same uh, rate. Uh, so that is an interesting uh, observer selection effect that is going on when dealing uh, with Q. And in general, of course, what's going on here is that our observations are not independent of what we're studying. And uh, not just in the um, uh, kind of standard hand wavy, uh, oh yes, you cannot observe something without interfering with it. Uh, this applies even to things where you cannot possibly interfere with what you're studying. Because you're correlated, but you're correlated with its existence. So, for example, everybody in this room is the descendant of a lineage of real winners. 99.9% of all species have gone extinct, but none of your ancestor species went extinct. Imagine that. What's the probability of that? Not only that, within each species, of course, you have a lot of lineages that also go extinct. And in many cases, that might be an even larger fraction. And again, none of our ancestors ever went extinct. Isn't that amazing? We can all trace our ancestors back to the primordial soup in a single unbroken line. <laughs> now, that's of course not that surprising given uh, that we exist. Given a random <laughs> fact, however, if you start with the primordial soup and uh, try to figure out who are the winners going to be that in a billion years are going to be doing philosophy lectures, it's going to be very, very unlikely that you find the right cells and can then trace them forward in time. Uh, so to some extent, these selection effects happen because we kind of view causality in a slightly backwards way. We look at an outcome, and now we see how unlikely it was. Uh, but of course, you can get all sorts of other fun uh, results out of this. So quite often, people talk about the anthropic principle. So I'm somewhat going to be talking about observer selection effect and sometimes slip my and say anthropic effect. This is because of the anthropic principle, which in its simplest form states that, well, the universe must be such that uh, the intelligent beings like us could exist, which is essentially a tough scholarly. And that idea has been very much debated, as I'm going to get to later, and has led to what people calling a lot of this field for anthropics. This is a bit hand wavy. Uh, the observer selection effect is a bit more exact because it's all about observers doing something. Again, there is nothing magical about the uh, act of observation except that that means that now we're studying something. It's not like in a new age quantum mechanics thing that the act of observation goes back in time and changes things. It's just that we, if you're familiar with probability, we're conditionalizing on our own existence, and that causes a lot of the probabilities to shift around in sometimes very weird ways. Um, now, the interesting thing is that we can try to think about this carefully, because a lot of weird things in nature might be very misleading. So again, just like uh, our ancestry being very, very lucky, we should also be very happy that this planet is right in the middle of the life zone on a very stable star that actually has a surprisingly flat orbit through the galaxy. And it might even be in what uh, is called the galactic life zone, where we both have high enough metallicity for plants to form, but not enough supernovas to blast them uh, all the time. It might also be that the rotation of Earth is stabilized by having an unusually large moon. Uh, I think it's only Pluto can boast with a heavier moon compared to its own size. And of course, we've got Jupiter that affects uh, the comet. And then there might have been a fairly large set of unlikely steps in our evolution uh, that uh, led to a, um, one of our ancestors uh, becoming a generalist and becoming intelligent. Again, what are the odds? The interesting thing is aliens across the universe might, uh, if they exist, make essentially the same argument. Uh, it might be that oh, this complete list actually is an accurate description that every intelligent species must have a large moon in order to stabilize the rotation of that. I doubt that. I don't believe really it's that important. But some of these things might turn out that every intelligent species has to have them. 
but that's of course not because uh, there is some mysterious force that means the future species make large moons pop up. It's just that you will only find intelligence where the conditions are right. So it's nothing that unusual about it. It also means that we cannot draw that much conclusions from our own existence um, about the universe. Earth might be really unusual, so we might actually be wrong about a lot of assumptions. And given the, our existence, it doesn't tell us much about how likely other intelligent uh, life might be. Again, we need to con uh, correct for these selection effects, and that can sometimes be rather tricky. So I'm going to start out with one uh, interesting application of this, and that is looking at anthropic shadows. So if we think about uh, our past, if a sufficiently big disaster had destroyed the biosphere on Earth and melted the, the Earth's crust, life would have exist, and no observers would exist to observe that there is a giant crater covering half the globe. So hence, um, uh, we might expect that uh, we might get interesting biases in our crater record. So we can imagine a simple toy model where you start out, and with some probability a disaster happens, and with some probability this is terminal. That is, no observers can ever uh, occur here. But with some probability, the uh, observers show up and can actually notice the, a big crater. Now, if we, for example, imagine that we start out with a large set uh, of planets, and then a whole bundle of them get bombarded, and then uh, they remove them from consideration, because not, no intents can ever uh, form there. But observers show up on a lot of other planets. OK. Uh, let's assume these observers then build spacecraft and go and meet each other and start comparing notes to try to figure out what's the rate of big disasters happening on other planets. And it turns out that they get a nice <laughs> estimate of, oh, yeah, it's about 27 of planets have been hit by something really large. While the actual number is actually 44% in this example. And again, this is because of the biasing effect, because the fewer observers on those planets that were hit. But the observers, of course, won't notice that, because non-existent observers won't vote. So you can uh, do the maps and actually look at, as a function of extinction probability from the disaster, uh, how overconfident they are about how safe the universe is. And essentially, if you're talking about very, very deadly disasters, you end up with observers that are really deluded about uh, how dangerous uh, the universe is. So you could imagine a universe where it's 50% chance uh, per year that plants just explode. And uh, there might, uh, in a sufficiently large such universe, be a few observers. And they will uh, really don't believe that plants can explode. Could you explain what the vertical axis is? Uh, so this is overconfidence. That's the ratio between the observed uh, or estimate probability and mm -hmm. actual probability. So uh, I'm going to send out uh, notes a bit later on this, and uh, you, you're going to get a link to the paper where we do all the stuff here. Uh, you can also analyze this as longer shades, of course, because not to, it's not just that one disaster that could have happened in the past. We can imagine that uh, every era has a set of mass extinctions and uh, meteor strikes and whatnot. So you want to kind of complicate things, but the overall effect is roughly the same. Now, Disasters might also be smaller than extinction, of course. And, uh, if we think about uh, the uh, asteroid that hit Earth and ended uh, the, the era of dinosaurs, it messed up the ecosystem for several million years later. There are very interesting fossil records uh, showing how the plant life started regrowing, and then later uh, how insects showed up. But it actually took a fair number of uh, years between uh, the trees showing up and some of the insects eating the leaves showing up in the fossil record. It seems like you got a very unstable ecosystem that was out of whack for you know, quite a long while. Eventually, of course, the biosphere filled the niches and new species evolved, and there was uh, the era of the big birds, etc. But the interesting part is, had that happened relatively recently, we would most likely not be around, of course, because, again, we probably need to exist in an ecosystem that's somewhat stable. So that means that you can do a model uh, where you assume disasters of different sizes leave a trace of chaos in their way. Now, that is the forward-looking causal effect. Asteroid strikes, ecosystem uh, gets crashed, a uh, few species survive, then more and more species survive. Looking backwards from this perspective of observer, of course, it's that observers should expect that there can't be a big disaster nearby in the past. So in, if you think about the size distribution, the severity distribution of them, 
Uh, so this could, for example, be asteroid strikes. Um, the time, so we're here. Uh, we can't see the really old disasters because they have been erased by erosion. Uh, and the really small ones <coughs> also disappear. And over here, we have the standard ones uh, that we look at. But around here, these ones cannot have happened because we wouldn't be around if they had happened. Now, we could unfortunately not prove this statistically, or maybe, but it kind of looks semi-plausible if you actually look at the diameter of meteor craters and their age. You kind of see here that there is this nice little boundary. There is unfortunately a few confounding factors, so, so this is weaker than it looks. But at least uh, as an intuition pump, I hope you can kind of get it. Over here, the small craters have disappeared. Uh, over here, you have a whole bundle of them that you, is actually very clear. So here, you have unbiased salt. You can also see it in the record of supervolcanoes. It's a bit fewer ones, but again, this is the volume uh, in the cubic kilometers of uh, the lava erupted, and this is age. And the one that's most extreme, Lake Toba, is uh, argued by some uh, to actually almost have wiped us out about about 80 to 75,000 years ago. There is some evidence of a genetic bottleneck about that time where humanity might have been down to a few hundred individuals. Uh, so that one is right there on the border where we would, might expect actually some form of tropic shadow. But again, we have a little bit too few data points to be really con confident about this. But the, 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 it shows that we might actually want to be careful about thinking about asteroid impact rates on Earth by looking at craters on Earth, because we might actually be seriously biased. However, we got an excellent satellite, the moon, that is unbiased. If something big hits the moon, uh, it leaves a crater, and the number of observers doesn't change. So we can actually control by checking the moon. Uh, and uh, similarly, there are some areas where it's very smart just to move out and uh, use a different data set. The problem is, of course, we humans might also create dangers for ourselves. <coughs> Uh, so I don't know if uh, Stanislav Petrov had been mentioned earlier in the course. After all, he should be mentioned all the time uh, because he's one of the great heroes of humanity. So in 1983, he say, likely saved the world by not pressing the button. And there have been quite a, lot, a frighteningly long list of close calls during the Cold War where people were shockingly close to launching nuclear weapons at each other. At the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, it was not just uh, that one of the spy, American spy planes were shot down uh, over the Soviet, Soviet Union, managed to escape while being pursued by nuclear armed fighters, uh, and that could very well have blown up. There was also um, uh, a bear trying to climb a fence uh, in Wisconsin, course, uh, triggering an accidental alarm that led to, again, the bombers uh, starting on uh, the, uh, to get up because the alarm bell had been misconnected, so it's the perimeter alarm was connected to the launch of the flight alarm. Uh, a guy <laughs> man, uh, managed to drive out in a car and block the uh, starting uh, uh, street. Uh, 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 and then it seems like uh, uh, there is one report at Okinawa, there was an erroneous report about launch missiles uh, at uh, China and uh, Russia. And we had our Kipov in, in the submarine managing to finally convince his comrades not to launch uh, nukes when they fought them. So these are four close calls during the missile crisis that we know of. And uh, over time, we have discovered more. So one interesting question is, uh, how safe have we been actually over the past 70 years? You could argue and use Pisces and probability to say, yeah, let's assume a uniform prior probability. Uh, 70 years of sampling, we get a new probability distribution, and you get a number for the risk. And this is surprisingly and shockingly high. It's kind of between around 0 0.1 uh, to the, the 1% per year of nuclear war risk. That's kind of way too much to start with. But this, of course, assumes no observer selection effect. If we assume nuclear war is guaranteed lethal for everybody, which is not strictly true, but if we do that as a simplified assumption, of course nobody would be around after nuclear war. You would actually get a strong bias. Um, so I'm uh, working on a paper together with a few colleagues where we're actually playing around with this. We have a, a model which I'm not going to get into too much detail about, where we look at the transitions between levels of different the intensity of international tension, and the final one is a full nuclear war, and nobody survives. Which means that you have a realization, but you can only see realizations that don't end in nuclear war. So it turns out that the probabilities people in these worlds would estimate, given what they have seen, they might be noting uh, the you know, setting of a doomsday clock and the bulletin of atomic scientists, for example, uh, they tend to be biased. So 
uh, in this case, uh, the red ones correspond to the probability of seeing a transition towards a more dangerous international state. And the blue ones are transition <coughs> towards a less uh, dangerous state. The green line is that true probability. So in the upper one, uh, you find that, yeah, when you're really close to the edge, you experience as an observer that it looks like you got saved. The actual probability is way less, but you're getting very overconfident because miracles do happen. Uh, well, if you have, um, uh, if you're far away, you don't get that much bias. There are some interesting subtleties here about how much you can predict. Given that we actually know our historical record, can we try to figure out how close we are to really lethal nuclear war or not? And it turns out that there is an interesting problem with the number of degrees of freedom. That means that we can't exactly calculate that. But we should expect that we're actually over-optimistic in some of our estimates, which is mildly frightening. Now, we can use this in other interesting ways, too, of course. Uh, while we're still on the kind of doomsday-ish side of things. So, so uh, um, again, one classic application of the mathematics of war is the German tank problem. How many of you have heard about that? You, of course, you and you, yeah. So this happened during the Second World War, that the Allies were capturing uh, some destroyed tanks, and the Germans, being very German about it, they were, of course, numbering the parts. And they're numbering them consecutively. So if you find that you have the tank number 127, how many tanks are there in the army? You can, of course, calculate this using statistics. And uh, if you only have one tank, uh, it turns out that the answer is uh, about twice the number. Uh, there are some interesting complications here. The, the predictions get much better if you have many more tanks. And of course, eventually the Germans found out and started encrypting the numbers and so on. So they broke it. But it, for a while, the statisticians were beating the intelligence people. The intelligence people were very carefully looking at the aerial photos, sending spies to factories and trying to estimate pro production. And they were off by a factor of 10, how many tanks were actually made, while the statisticians got things in the right order surprisingly well. OK, let's apply this now to humanity. Everybody of us has a birth order. We can order all humans who have ever existed uh, simply by the order of the birth. Uh, given our own birth order, what can we say about how many humans there will ever be? So we can imagine how many this little queue of uh, humans. And of course, we should expect ourselves, by roughly the same reasoning as in the tank from it, to be somewhere in the middle. Certain variants, of course, but uh, in the middle. Of course, we can't use the fact that we're all in this room to kind of compare our birth order because we're kind of strongly correlated by being uh, right here, right now in the philosophy faculty. So, uh, but we can use our own birth order at least to get a smidgen of evidence. And then we can start thinking like, okay, there has been a hundred billion people, give or take, before me. How many people will there be after? So the simplest possible calculation would be to assume it's going to be about 100 billion people after me. So if we assume the human population levels out at about uh, 9 billion people and keep at that until some future doomsday, you get uh, that, okay, humanity will survive for 1,111 years. That's not very long. That's actually fairly close by. Not perhaps tomorrow, but very close. These numbers, by the way, came from an XKCD what if strip where he was calculating how long uh, we should expect to Twitter to be around. <coughs> because you can, of course, apply this to a lot of other things, too. If something has been around for a long while, you have some evidence that it might be alone for a long while, too. About, at least about the same. There are interesting problems with this. Uh, so, one of the, the people who came up with this principle, uh, we can go up to, might have come up in uh, the, the Toby's talk about the astronomy. Uh, is an astronomer who's done a lot of good work, pointed out that if you're at a wedding, you're un you shouldn't predict that the marriage is not going to last many minutes. Because the reason you are at a wedding is because the marriage is starting. So you get a very biased information there. But it doesn't seem like we are having a very biased position here. Or maybe there is. This is a, a really big bone of contention, as we're going to see. Uh, we can, of course, try to analyze it in other ways. We can say, well, maybe you might will grow exponentially. That, of course, really makes things even worse, because now we should expect doomsday even faster. You can try to be fancy and calculate with confidence intervals, and that doesn't change things very much. So these arguments seem to imply that we should actually expect the humanity not to last very long, which is interesting and uh, scary. 
But also, as everybody tends to say, but this argument can't be right. I think it's a very common reaction. And the interesting part is not that people react to the, the argument, but that then uh, the idea about rebutting it turn out to be so hard. Most of the bad arguments have at least one or two good arguments against them that eventually lay them to rest. The doomsday argument is very much of an undead that always kind of lurches up when you thought you were safe. So, I, and this is a part where I'm definitely not an expert. I'm just going to point it out uh, and I'm going to try to have the right uh, references in uh, the, the handout. Uh, some of the discussions have led to this question about the underlying assumptions, which are, of course, where all the trouble really starts. So one of the, the approaches might be to say that, yeah, uh, just like uh, in the case of um, uh, the, the car queues, uh, we should be counting kind of moments spent in the, the being in the queue, or instances of standing in, the, in line. Others would say, no, no, that, that's the wrong way of going around it. How many of you have heard about the sleeping beauty problem? The usual suspects. Yeah. So the, the, in the Sleeping Beauty problem, uh, uh, the fairy godmothers uh, were playing a weird game with Sleeping Beauty. So they explained to her before putting her to sleep that, yeah, we're going to flip uh, the coin. And uh, if it's heads, uh, we're going to wake you up on Monday. And if it's tails, we're going to wake you up on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, but uh, you're, of course, going to be sleepy. You're not going to remember anything. You're just briefly going to wake up and then continue sleeping. So now Sleeping Beauty wakes up, and the fairy godmother asks, so, which, uh, which day do you think it is? What should she answer? And this is interesting. How many think that uh, she should uh, say that it's Monday uh, with a high probability? And how many of you think it should be Tuesday? And it's interesting because quite a lot of people have very different intuitions about this. Uh, you, can, you can kind of see it as um, you have two boxes. Either she wakes up on Monday or she wakes up on Monday and Tuesday. So the ones that uh, say that, yeah, uh, uh, one approach is saying, well, it's 50-50 here. So it's either here or here. Another one would say, no, no, it's one third chance we distribute it like that. And that, I think, is the kind of the difference between these assumptions. And they lead to very, very deep rabbit holes indeed. Uh, so one of the problems here is uh, if you accept uh, the self-sampling assumption, then the doomsday argument um, holds, and you need to worry about it. The self-indication assumption allows you to get away from the doomsday argument, because it essentially favors worlds where there are loads of observers. Which means that uh, you should expect that actually there is going to be an enormous big future out there. Uh, it also unfortunately runs into other thought experiments that uh, lead to trouble. Uh, and then, of course, we can quarrel about reference classes. Well, wait a minute. We're thinking about humans here. What if we become super advanced post humans that think in a fundamentally different way from us? Maybe they don't count. So what the only thing the doomsday argument says is that within a few thousand years we become super advanced post humans. <laughs> We are, after all, not counting those animals before the monkeys. Uh, we are just thinking about the 100 billion people. The problem is, what, why does it have to be humans? What about observers? And some people have even argued, no, no, we need to think about humans living in a world with weapons of mass destruction. That's the only people who count in this case. And so on. I'm going to leave this, because uh, I don't, I'm honestly don't know how to handle it. And uh, the, the, I have references that are way better. Uh, see Nick's uh, dissertation uh, for a little look at it. Uh, but basically, this is something uh, one can uh, play around with endlessly. I'm more interested in more concrete problems, like black holes eating the Earth. I think that is a very concrete problem. So as you might remember a few years back, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, before that, uh, the Large Ion Collider at Brookhaven had a bunch of people who were rather concerned about uh, risk. What if uh, those particle collisions produce black holes that fall into Earth and absorb it? Or maybe stable, strange matter that, uh, again, compress the Earth into matter. Or destabilize the vacuum structure of uh, the universe. And then you get uh, true vacuum spreading at the speed of light, kind of erasing everything in its path. You can't even see it coming. 
Now, the physicists were ra rather annoyed when they actually got sued and taken to court about this, and uh, eventually they had to write a bundle of papers and arguments about it. <clears throat> and one of the best uh, arguments, uh, rhetorically speaking, is Earth has been hit since uh, the beginning by cosmic rays that are way more powerful what, than what we can uh, make in the accelerator. Earth is still here. Now, what's wrong with that argument? <laughs> Well, by now it's kind of obvious, of course. We have a serious observer selection effect here. Uh, the anthropic shadow argument is uh, really applicable here. So we cannot actually use that. However, the moon would make a pretty good uh, uh, counterexample. The moon is still there. In fact, if uh, um, doing particle physics was dangerous, we should expect to see a solar system full of imploded bodies. We don't. Hence, the Large Hadron Collider is safe. Not so fast, of course, because if you were to implode Jupiter into a black hole, a lot of energy would be released, and Earth would probably be wiped out anyway. So that actually doesn't work. You need to patch it a little bit more. So the solution is to look at distant solar systems, and especially distant stars. So if you look at the supernova of it, that's the way of actually getting it right without getting an observer effect, which is kind of annoying. Another problem is, what about vacuum decay? You can't even see it coming. It might be a very rare thing, but there might be a wall of different nothingness approaching us at the speed of light. And there is a really fun paper in Nature by Max Tegmark and Nick Kostrom, where they use the age of Earth here as an argument. Because imagine that we have a universe where we're, then, uh, it's very, very dangerous. The probability per unit of time uh, of uh, vacuum decay is high. Where should we expect of the observers to be? They have to be very early, because at later times there is nothing left to observe. Uh, in a safe universe, of course, observe it could be uh, throughout uh, the, the time. So if you uh, use the estimates of when planets formed, and then condition on the fact uh, that we are a planet that's actually formed rather late compared to the rest of them, you can actually make a fairly tight argument that, yeah, the chance per year is less than one in a billion of a vacuum decay happening to us, which is good. It's actually even more awesome than that, because it covers all kinds of disasters that fall in a very big class, including stuff we have never ever thought about. It's kind of possible to come up with really weird physics disasters. Uh, I invented at least two or three entirely new ones, uh, to the great annoyance of some physicists. Uh, but the, even better is to have an argument that shows that, look, this big category is actually smaller than that, you don't need to work. But still, observer selection effect leads to interesting questions and paradoxes, like suppose the Hadron Collider actually was dangerous, would there be any way for us to observe that, given that we will of course only exist in those worlds that weren't wiped out? Well, one way of noticing that it would be unsafe is that every time you try to turn it on, something happens that blocks it. You get a sudden delay, or the power goes out, or a bird drops a sandwich on a transformer. That actually happened and delayed the, the large Hadron Collider. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, there have been enough delays, of course, to make you slightly suspicious, but when you try to run the math, you realize, compared to the, the simpler explanation, that actually it's a big, complicated piece of machinery with a lot of stuff that needs to go right. Yeah, this doesn't seem to incre increase our credence that it's dangerous very much. But if a miracle ha ha happened every time you try to turn it on, then you would actually have somewhat good evidence that there is something very dangerous happening here. And then you can also use that in amusing ways, of course. For example, to stop terrorism. Every time there's a terrorism report, you just automatically turn on the collider. Yeah. And wouldn't it be more likely, if it were really dangerous and we were getting this effect, that there'd be some common cause? Like, if we'd had, if we'd seen a political will saying, this is too dangerous, we shouldn't turn it on, and it never happened, that would be evidence that it was, in fact, dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the problem is, of course, you might have a selection effect, because uh, we have a political will in Europe that genetically modified organisms are dangerous. I don't think they are an existential threat that will kind of instantly wipe out the world if we uh, modify the DNA in the wrong way. So it's hard to distinguish kind of normal political will for normal reasons versus this miraculous political will. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's very hard to, in practice, draw any good conclusions from a particular particle accelerator. But you can make some very fun thought experiments based on this. But yeah, common causes are way more likely. In fact, uh, when I was blogging about that, I was thinking, what if there exists a crazy conspiracy that uh, we're trying to sabotage the Hadron Collider? That's also kind of likely. Although, of course, if it actually was dangerous, the probability of such a conspiracy <laughs> forming would be high. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, another application of this uh, leads over to the question, why aren't we seeing loads of aliens? So, uh, as you know, the uh, Drake equation uh, is an estimate of the number of uh, alien civilizations that exist at this point in time in the Milky Way. So you have terms like uh, the rate of star formation times the probability of having planets, the number of Earth-like planets per solar system, probability of getting life, probability of getting intelligence, probability that it communicates with us stuff we might notice, times <coughs> the lifespan of civilizations. And uh, we know some of the first terms to some precision, and the rest is still guesswork. And uh, if you go to the Wikipedia page, it's very amusing to see the numbers people have put in, because you can literally get any answer you want. It stretches <laughs> over so many orders of magnitude that it's unbelievable. Uh, but in general, it seems uh, that reasonable to assume that this number cannot be super high, because then we would actually know this. It cannot be that there are trillions of civilization in the Milky Way. Uh, that would be rather hard to hide. Uh, so one can make an argument that at least one of these terms need to be relatively small. And this was phrased by Robin Hanson uh, as a symptom. So we might think of a set of steps uh, that you need to get through before you become an uh, interstellar civilization that uh, is uh, showing up and being very obvious. So one is that life might uh, need to form. We don't know the probability of that, but it might very well be that that is very unusual. It might also be, of course, that you have various evolutionary steps you need to get through. Maybe getting eukaryotic cells, uh, which are way more flexible and modular than the prokaryotic cells. That's actually really hard to do. Or maybe photosynthesis is something that most uh, biosphere never figure out. Uh, or it might be that intelligence is the problem. Maybe it's uh, hard to make uh, a nervous system that actually learns. Or it might indeed be that we don't survive very long. So, uh, now, if one of these uh, no cases is a very strong filter, if we find out that actually life is super easy, there is life on every solid body that can host life, then we know that that is not a filter. We must instead increase our credence that, yeah, it's one of these ones that uh, is the problem. So, uh, and of course, if we then get told, actually, it seems that like intelligence is super easy to evolve once you have life. In that case, it's really bad news, because then we actually would know that there is a filter ahead of us. Even worse, uh, we might know that other <coughs> intelligent life has presumably also faced the same thing, and they haven't survived that without, mm -hmm. even though they knew about the great filter. So exactly what it is must be something rather weird. Uh, again, the interesting part here is that we can actually try to model this statistically and uh, analyze it. There have been some interesting recent uh, work about how the prior probability you put in make this a bit shaky in interesting ways, but this is a very active uh, area of research in astrobiology. And this is also why uh, maybe you should pray that we don't find life on Mars. Or uh, we might uh, want to figure out that intelligence is really hard, but a lot of animals seem to be much smarter uh, than we think. Uh, I'm getting to the end here and then getting more over to discussion, but I'm just going to mention a few more speculative and weird ones because they're kind of the wine of the house, I think. A lot of this has been investigated by Nick Bostrom, <laughs> and uh, I think uh, it would be a shame not to at least mention it. Uh, so the simulation argument uh, is based on observation, but it seems relatively likely, at least uh, to Nick and me, that you could run simulated minds and they would have uh, experiences that would be real mental experiences. And uh, if you're an advanced civilization, you can run a lot of them. The resources it takes to run a neural network on current computers are pretty big, but compared to future computers, they're going to be very small. And advanced civilization can have very large amounts of resources. And we might actually want to run simulations as screensavers, as historical reenactments, in order to figure out what life really was back in the, in the dark early days of the 21st century, or maybe to resurrect ancestors uh, uh, because a religion or a philosophy, that's a great thing. You can come up with a very, very long list of possible reasons. Now, given that, one would expect that most minds would actually be simulated minds, and hence, given uh, at least some of these assumptions, we should expect that we're pretty likely simulate minds. The way out of that is to either deny that you can run these uh, simulations, or that posthumans would like uh, to you know, run that, or uh, indeed argue that, no, no, we're not going to get to a posthuman state. <laughs> and again, you get interesting uh, results from all of these assumptions. Whatever uh, conclusion uh, you draw, you get some kind of unwelcome side effects. 
Uh, other things uh, that are fun, uh, but we just worth mentioning briefly, is of course, a lot of physics seems to be pretty uh, fine tuned. If you change some of the parameters, you can't get life or planets or stars or things like that. For example, uh, the cosmological constant is absurdly tiny. If it was slightly larger, space time would have a tendency in, uh, to just uh, shrink up. Uh, you need to make sure that uh, the ratio between the electromagnetic coupling constant and the strong force is in a very small region because if it, the strong force is too strong, you, know, you don't get the nuclei like uh, we uh, would like. Uh, in, if in the electromagnetic stuff is a little bit too strong, carbon is unstable and we can't get life, and um, so on. The number of dimensions, well, three dimensions plus one time dimension is actually pretty nice. It's very hard to make information processing a life function if you have a different number of dimensions, and so on. So you can use these arguments, of course, if you have a religious bent to say, oh, yes, I see the hand of the creator here, and he wanted us to be around. So that's why he set the fine structure concept to 1 over 137, give or take. <laughs> that's one approach to it. Another one is, of course, to say, hey, this is the weak anthropic principle. We couldn't be around in a world that had different settings. Uh, so maybe the settings just vary across the universe, or indeed we have a multiverse of a lot of uh, possible states. And, uh, well, most of the multiverse is empty, because there is just black holes or uh, gas or quark, uh, quark soups. But in some small areas, there is complexity and life in observers, and they will all believe that the universe is made just for them. Uh, and again, we have this ongoing debate, uh, which is um, quite uh, interesting. Uh, so this is linked to discussions about, well, these ant anthropic principles, do they actually tell us something about the bigger shape or meaning of the universe? Maybe our existence as observers is actually important for the universe. And you can uh, add as much or as little mysticism to this as you want. So Brandon Carter coined the term, the, he coined the term for the weak anthropic principle. And then the stronger one says that the universe must be such that admit the creation of observers within it at some stage. And that must is kind of sneaking in a little bit of teleology here. Now there is a bit of meaning. Uh, Barrow and Tipler, this is uh, one of my favorite books ever. I grew up reading this and rereading it and so on. Uh, it does this even more strongly. And uh, indeed, the Tipler then went up the deep end and argued the final anthropic principle that, yep, uh, without uh, intelligent observers uh, to do such a thing, the universe couldn't even exist. So it's kind of a self enclosed system. And then it really goes off on the deep end in very amusing ways, but let's leave that. <laughs> um, but um, eventually, of course, we have this problem that if we have very big universes and uh, observers, we are sometimes getting random observers. And if the universe is really big and really long lost, we are going to get random Boltzmann brains popping up uh, randomly for no causal reason. And of course, we're going to be in the minority. So why do we think we have normal uh, brains? And, our experiences of normal physics tell us something about the real universe, when it, we should think that it's more likely that we are a Boltzmann brain floating around in the far future. Can you explain what a Boltzmann brain is? Yeah, so the, essentially, if you wait long enough, of course, quantum mechanics will make particles pop out of nothing for no uh, reason. It's just random processes. Wait even longer. Occasionally, you're going to get molecules. Wait ridiculously long times, and you get, you get brains, or even Boltzmann planets and Boltzmann galaxies. They don't have any causal reason to exist. They're just a quantum mechanical fluctuation. You need to wait a ridiculously long periods of time. Uh, because basically, you need, this is way, way after the last electron in the universe has kind of been redshifted uh, out. Uh, so every particle that remains has been kind of its own little separate universe at this point. But of course, if the universe just persists, these fluctuations will happen. And you get an infinite number of them. So you get an infinite number of anomalous observers who are just essentially random. And this is a bit of a problem because they swamp the normal observers, which we like to think we are. So one approach is to, is to argue that maybe the universe won't last indefinitely. All our cosmology right now seems to suggest it would. But maybe this is a reason, for example, to believe in big rip scenarios that says that at some point the universe just expands so much that it actually literally disappears in finite time. Uh, and again, there are interesting epistemic discussions about that maybe you can actually get rid of the Boltzmann brains in other practical ways without doing weird cosmology. Maybe it's just, just an epistemic problem. But again, I don't have the time to get into that. I really want to kind of open up with questions, and thank you for listening.
So, questions? Yeah? Uh, is there anything in general that you can say about the shape of the entropic shadow? Like, uh, in certain cases, it will be sort of a, the limit will be abrupt, and then suddenly things will stop happening. Like, you will stop suddenly seeing uh, craters of a, a certain size, or whether it's more sort of smooth and... You know. uh, in, in, the, in the crater uh, case, uh, it has to do with how quickly does ecosystems recover after uh, mass extinctions. And we know a fair bit about that. Unfortunately, we don't know the other part we need to know, and that is how much does that affect observers. I think the simplest <laughs> assumption is, yeah, a number of species probably affects the probability of observers or something like that. But there might be much more nuanced things like, yeah, uh, for um, the intelligent species to actually be able to survive, you need to have an ecosystem that has a certain level of stability. But my guess would be it's going to be some kind of tapering function, uh, so it might be a, a, some power law or some exponential or something. In the case of supervolcanoes, it's kind of easier because there we have a global disaster that uh, lasts for about a decade or more where you have very severe climate change. But after that, climate recovers and over a span of kind of ecological succession time returns. So there, I think you have a much more distinct one. It's essentially just a pulse where you probably can't get any observers. But this depends very much on the kind of disaster you have. But it's a good question. I would love to investigate that more. If you have any ideas of how, please yeah, I was. I think I already brought that to you, but I'm not sure how exactly to. I think your paper was already accounting for all the, the thing that I was saying, but it seems like with human actions where you have perhaps high correlation, and if you are really close to maybe launching a nuclear attack, it means that uh, society was constructed as such that. Uh, you end up getting really close to that place all the time. So actually those societies uh, do not happen and you have sort of a shadow that not only exclude, ex 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 uh, not, not only you have to remove the, the, the real extinction, but all events that are sort of near to them. Hmm. Uh, you can get some weird effects. So, so one scenario we were playing around with uh, looks like this. So we can imagine three states. So one state of uh, total peace, uh, everything is really nice and fine, and uh, it's 1% uh, chance for every year that you remain in that, and it's 99% uh, chance uh, that you get into a, a state of war, which with 100% chance leads to nuclear war and everybody dying. Now, this slightly horrific world, uh, if you're an observer showing up in the year 100, what state should you expect yourself to be in? Well, most histories, of course, if you don't care, if you stand outside, like the aliens on spacecraft watching you, they will, of course, see a history where very few in the world stay here, most go here, and then immediately get destroyed. But an observer that's around in year 100 is going to uh, notice this uh, process of, yeah, very peaceful, up until year 99, and then we switched over to this state. I wonder what's going to happen next. <laughs> uh, so in this case, you have this interesting effect that the anthropic effect is stronger in the past than in the present. In this case, of course, I use this slightly contrived example to get a very strong effect. Uh, what you said also got me to think about how people adjust the probabilities, because in practice, the Cold War wasn't just that we're randomly moving around between one international crisis or the taunt uh, randomly. People also got scared by some things and decided, oh, we need permissive action links of the missiles so people can't launch them uh, arbitrarily. That probably changed the actual underlying probability set. By adding the red phone uh, between Kremlin and uh, the, the White House, they also probably reduced a risk objectively. We can't exactly tell in the actual uh, pathways what was happening, but the underlying system was, of course, changing over time. So maybe we can also say that we might have had a selection uh, for 